<clears throat> How are you guys? Doing great, how are Hello. All right, guys, we're going to give everybody about three more minutes. We'll start at 6.05 because we've had a few more jump in on the participation part. So we'll wait till then and we'll start.
Hey guys, all right, we will get started tonight. So the goal for tonight, we'll go through 16, 17, and 18. Um, 16 is only 27 slides, so we'll run through most of it quickly. Hopefully we'll be out of here a little early tonight. Um, any questions for me as far as um, where we're at on class work, book work, any of that? And then I guess the only other question I have is, can you guys hear me out there in Zoom land? I can hear you. I have a question too. Can you hear me? Okay, maybe not. Hello? All right, I got one to text back. Um, where you guys can hear me, so we'll keep moving on then. All right, so... Um, chapter 16 on reassessment. I said, guys, it's a short one, so we'll be fairly quick through this one. So with reassessment, it really does come down to, I mean, it's just what the word says. We're going back, we're repeating any key elements of this um, assessment and already um, procedures already performed. I mean, it's, we're checking our interventions and making sure that what we're doing is having the effect that we want. And if it's not, then we're going to change our treatment plan with it. Um, and then never, um, unless, never be skipped, except for when the life-saving interventions prevent you from doing it. So there are times on a call that you are going to spend all of your time dealing with airway or dealing with um, any of the, many of those kind of things. And uh, if... If you're spending your whole call trying to manage an airway or control bleeding or do any of that, and that's all you get to, that's totally fine. Um, because we've got to obviously do those life life um, saving interventions too. So it's going to identify changes, subtle, whether they're subtle or not, or obvious. Um, like I said, we're checking our um, interventions and we're seeing whether our trends are if we're trending in a deterioration or whether we're improving. Um, if they're deteriorating, does that necessarily mean that something's wrong with what our treatment plan is at the moment? Not a lot. I mean, it can be. It's definitely something if you're seeing it and you're seeing, um, you're seeing changes and things in the person that you don't like, obviously go back and look at it, but there are some patients too that it just, they weren't good when we got them and um, we may not be seeing improvements, but hopefully we're slowing the curve or however you want to say that too. Um, but if you're reassessing and you're seeing deteriorate, it's definitely um, a reason though to check your treatment plan and see if there's something that could be missed with it. So at this point too, um, we're going to communicate with the patient, kind of explain the process, um, explain where we're at, and also to the patient's um, family too at this point. If you can, we can talk through them. Um, this is really a good point too if they're feeling anxious and anxiety that we can talk through them with it um, and get them on board on with what we're doing treatment-wise too. So some components of it, though, we're going to retract any life-threatening illnesses, um, reassess mental status. So we're going to, you're going to basically start over at the top of the sheet. We're going to give you guys some sheets, some skill sheets on the patient assessment. You're going to start right at the top. We're going to check our mental status. We're going to check airway, breathing, pulse rate and quality, monitor skin color and temperature and reestablish the patient as a priority. How often should we do this, guys? Have you guys had a chance to read the chapter yet? Okay, so 15 minutes if they're stable. And if they're unstable, it's every five minutes. Okay, perfect. And then when we're talking on the patient priorities, that is our treatment. Okay, so if we had somebody in a trauma and we established the priority should be an airway or bleeding, then we're going to make sure that that's still our priority because they can change too. So let's say we had a, a, a patient that was a trauma, was in a car wreck, um, had a major bleed that we controlled, and all of a sudden as we're 
redoing our assessment and kind of coming back through the mental, we noticed that he's showing signs of a stroke too. So was it a medical that caused a trauma? Two is kind of what we're looking at that. So if we controlled the bleeding, but now we have a stroke, what's our priority? Stroke, okay. Um, pediatric note. So the mental status of an unresponsive child or infant can be checked by shouting verbal stimulus and flicking the feet. Um, it's a painful stimulus. So it goes back to the app, right? Are they alert, verbal, painful stimulus, or unresponsive? Um, crying too, you, you guys have heard me say this multiple times in this class too, that it's an expected response from a child with an adequate mental status. Um, if baby's crying in the back of the rig with me, life is golden. Um, I'll deal with the screaming and headache that comes with it if that means they're having airway with me. So we're going to reassess and record vital signs, compare results with the baseline measurement, which is why we want to try and get those, if at all possible, before we do a lot of interventions, just so we know where we were at. Um, but by all means, we're not going to withhold the life-saving like oxygen, controlling bleeding, managing the airway um, for baseline set of vitals. Just as quick as we can, we're going to get those those so we have something to trend it with. Um, Reevaluate re oxygen saturation. And then this is a time too where we can spend a little more time and document um, findings and identify trends. So what might, uh, what's a, an example of a problem that might develop into a life threat to a patient on the way to the hospital? Who do I have out in Zoom land? All right, Jason, what would be an example of a problem and a life threat to a patient that could change or develop in, on the way to the hospital? Uh, probably an asthma attack or low blood sugar from a diabetic. Am I not hearing you? Can you hear me? Uh, let's try it. Jason, I can see you're unmuted but it's not coming through on my end. How about you, Jessica? Can I, will you unmute and see if I can hear you or Kevin by chance? I don't think you can hear us, but I heard the other guy on Zoom. Can you hear me? All right. It's something on my end, guys. Sorry, I'm not sure why I'm not hearing you. At least I, last time I could hear you a little. So some... I'll throw out a few of them here and we can kind of talk through some of them that can develop on the way to the hospital. Um, airway issues are a big one for us. So if we have any kind of a burn patient, a, um, a stroke, airway, cardiac, airway is the big one that changes. Um, So airway is the big one for me that can change into it. Also strokes can change. Um, and it comes back to airway anaphylaxis. There is another one that changes on it because that can, the reaction can come back. Um, so any of those that um, narcotic overdoses is another big one that can happen with us too. So some components, too, of it, we're going to repeat the pertinent parts of the history and physical exam, meaning if we had a trauma patient and we found an injury, we're going to reassess it, check for bleeding, make sure we still have a pulse, um, do all of those things with it that way, too. Um, then we're going to ask about changes in symptoms, especially ones anticipated because of treatments. Remember, we're reevaluating. We're wanting to make sure what we're doing is working. And then repeat the physical exam. It doesn't always have to be a detailed exam, but um, just for me, I always like to look and do a quick mental head to toe, um, check and make sure that um, we haven't missed any part of the body, especially with traumas. Like they're not, they've not had their complete assessment until they're trauma naked. I mean, they're, all the clothing has to come off, have to see the whole body. Come on, play with me. So we're going to check our interventions.
So we've talked bleeding is one. What's another intervention that we'd need to check? Let's look at a medical one. Um, and I know you guys can't talk, and I'm sorry, or at least I can't hear you guys on my end. So I will try at the break and see if I can't figure that out. Um, so one of the other ones, too, on a medical is you guys are going to be able to do patient-assisted drugs. So we can talk about, um, like, inhalers. Um, so if we've given somebody an inhaler and we want to check on whether it worked or not, um, the big one that you can do for it is we're going to listen to breath sounds again. Um, we can check and make sure their difficulty breathing. We can go back to our OPQRST questions um, and ask all those on it too. Drug overdose is the same way. Um, broken bones that we can check and make sure we still have CMS, PMS, things like that to make sure we still have our sensory motor and um, pulse. So we're going to observing trends um, and we hope that they're positive trends, but we want to make sure that we're seeing some kind of change. Um, so, and we're going to write, if we see it and we do it, we're going to document it. We want to make sure it's over a period of time. We've already hit on that too, right? The stable is every 15 minutes and unstable is every five. Um, and some of them can even be up to two minutes that you're going to readdress. Um, and if we're not seeing the trends that we like, we're going to try a new trend, um, make adjustments, and move on with our treatment and see if we can find a new set of treatments to get the trend that we want. We can go back to, um, as we talk at um, stuff for the national and for purposes of this class, is we're saying you guys are BLS ambulance. Um, meaning that you don't have advanced services with you, so you have to call for them for all of your class stuff. So part of it, you may have a, a scenario where they're talking about, um, like we talked the anaphylaxis or an airway issue. Um, you gave them the inhaler. We're still seeing some issues with it. What would your next course of action be? And for a lot of them, it'll be call ALS, get some other medications coming. So as you guys are going on that and looking at these test questions, especially if any of you guys ran or um, are around ambulance personnel, just remember that most services run as an advanced service, even in the state of Utah. Um, so a lot of the times we forget or try and look at it as if we're on an ambulance that has ALS or advanced life support. And for purposes of this test, it does not. You don't have it unless it specifically states it in the scenario or question. Uh, we've hit on a lot of this too, patient's condition as well as length of time with the patient will turn up how often you recess, meaning we'd like to, in theory, even if it's a stable patient and you've only got a 15 to 20 minute transport time, we really need to see more than one set of vitals. So if, like for a, a lot of us, both here on San Pete and in the Carbon County side, our transport times are fairly short. So it may be a stable patient that um, five to 10 minutes later, we're going to do another reassessment on them. Um, and then the more serious the condition, the more often you're going to reassess it. So when to reassess, hopefully we've hit this one to death already. Um, every 15 minutes for a stable patient, every five minutes for a an unstable or a potentially unstable patient. So some examples of a potentially unstable would be a cardiac arrest, um, stroke, seizure, um, a loss, a severe loss of blood, um, any kind of a severe airway problem, even if at the time, you know, our, our treatments have worked and they're breathing well, we've got the bleeding under control, their heart attack seems to be leveled off for a little bit, they're still going to be in every five minute deal just because they have the potential of becoming unstable. And then also, too, um, if you believe there's been a change in the patient's condition. So if you guys look at a patient and all of a sudden you look at them going, they're tanking, why? 
then that's a really good time to repeat at least the primary assessment, go through our ABCs, right? We gotta check our airway, our breathing, our circulation, um, and go over that again with them. All right, I know you guys can't type or you guys can't talk right now or I can't hear you. Is there any of you guys that have a question on chapter 18 or 16, excuse me? All right, take five, 10 minutes. Let me get the next set of slides up and we'll start again. Hey, is anybody there by their computer they can unmute and see if the changes that I just did fixed so I can hear you guys? How about now, Brandon? Can you hear me? Uh, 
It's not looking so good. Thank you, Jason. I can see that you've un <laughs> muted. How about now? Try again, Jason. How about now? Can you hear me? Hello? All right. No, no good. Right. Thanks, Jason. Yep, no problem.
All right, guys, we'll get started. Just a second. Well, let me get this back up for some reason. When I go to screen share, it won't work for me. All right. So now you guys can see my screen, uh, I guess, here we go. So we're gonna start on chapter 17 and try and move through it. Um, it's, it's a little bigger, but now we, hopefully some of this is stuff that you guys have seen and a lot of it's common sense. And I tell you this from personal experience, a lot of it is stuff that you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, you know, I've used the one that I'm dealing with right now in Wyoming that the court case I had up there, um, they pushed it out until February now again. So it's going to be three and a half years from the incident by the time I actually testify. And so I've really had to look back at my communication and my documentation for this room. Come on, play it with me. Um, so we'll go over communication systems, the verbal report, interpersonal pre-hospital, and then some special documentation issues. So this is the one that it talks about too. When we look at um, how we use the communication and what we have, most of the time when we talk the base station and mobile and portable radios, they're actually the ones that are mounted in the cars, the ambulance, whatever it is you're taking. Um, for here in San Pete County, I'm not sure in Carbon County, we have two base stations. We have the Horseshoe that is up north. It actually sets up on the Moroni Hill here. And then the South End Repeater sets over on White Mountain, I believe. Um, so it's the base station. It sends out a signal to the mobile radios and the portable radios, and it's also a repeater too. Um, so they're technically called a repeater, not a base station. I think the base station for that would be Manti for us. Um, so it goes from the base station to those two repeaters and out to us. The big one though that we're using now has actually come down to the cell phones and telemetry. So a lot of our equipment um, is um talking and sending information to the hospital like our monitors and things when we're working a cardiac arrest we can link up um there and the hospital staff and er can see us um see what we're doing and see the monitor um so new technology is developing almost constantly whether it's computers tablets um six years ago eight years ago it was a great big honking laptop that was a brick and now they're small iPads and the ambulances that we're doing our reports with. And I mean, it's just constantly changing. Um, there are backup radios in many systems too. Um, for you guys at the mine, you know as well as I do, a lot of the times this new technology doesn't work. We had leaky feeders um, in the mine that we could talk through the radios and um, they worked great. Um, the new systems we have now, it's a nice new Bumblebee. It's a little cell phone we carry, cell phone looking thing with us. Um, it doesn't work very well a lot of the time. So, um, and then the down system, a lot of the times it does come down to um, preventative maintenance and repair. So dispatch center, that would be your base station for us it would be uh, Manti down at the county court or the county jail. Goes out to the two repeaters and then from there it goes out to um, the EMS unit and the portable radios or the radio mounted in the rig. Um, some things to remember is though it is regulated by the FCC, it assigns the license and designated frequency. So like Sampe County is Quebec. When you go over to um, Carbon County, Juab, they have a different call sign. So for us, it's 1Q503, um, 1Q504, 1Q500. Um, but it, they do that to prevent interference with emergency radio traffic. And then 
prohibits profanities and offensive language. Um, and that's all subjective. It's not objective either. So um, with the, the new way that we look at words and things like that, that is one to definitely consider because there's not like a list of words that you can go on the FCC website and get which ones will get you in trouble. Okay. Anyway, food for thought with that one. So the principles of radio communication. Um, so make sure your volume is adjusted properly. Reduce the background by closing the windows if possible. Like most, most of our ambulances now are new, have AC and heat, so you shouldn't have to roll the window down because it creates the wind through that mic. If you have the window down, all they hear is just the wind. You can have it right to your mouth and they won't hear you with it. Okay. Take a second, um, listen to the frequency, ensure that it's clear before you begin the transmission. Um, especially if there's multiple, let's say we're going to a fire or a accident scene and there's multiple agencies responding, um, pay attention to make sure you're not miking over the top of another unit calling in or out. Um, because the repeater will only allow um, one at a time. And the first one keyed in, um, a lot of the times we'll get kicked out if somebody else keys in or they will hold it and you think you've called in and told dispatch that you're in route or that you've arrived on scene and they didn't even hear you because you, you guys were over the top of each other. So press the talk button on the radio wait for one second before speaking. Um, it takes just that long to, to give it. So you push it, count one, and then go. Speak with your lips about two to three inches from the microphone. Um, when you're calling another unit or a base station, use their name or number first, followed by yours. Because they're not, especially dispatched, they are so used to that in the background that if there's officers talking back and forth or fire departments or whatever, they, they just tune it out. So if you're going to call for another ambulance, let's say we're trying to call Fairview, we can even say 1Q504, this is 1Q503. Um, so you wanna give theirs first to cue them in that you're after them and then um, give them yours so they know who to respond back to. Um, if the unit calls you, tells you to stand by, wait until um, they're ready to take your transmission, that is huge with dispatch on multiple, especially if we have multiple agencies. Um, they have an EMS line, they have a fire line, they can listen on the state line. So they could have multiple different radio transmissions trying to come in and talk to them. So be patient with them. Um, speak um, slowly and clearly, and then keep the transmission brief, um, about 30 seconds. Stop, take a pause so that the traffic can, other emergency traffic can use the frequency if necessary. Um, use plain English and avoid codes. So you can tell the age of an EMS by this too, if we still know the 10, the 10 codes, the 1023, 1017, 1024, 108, all of those good ones, they're gone now. Um, so it's just plain English. Hey, we're, we're leaving the scene. We've arrived on scene, whatever it may be, the patient we've arrived on scene to one patient that is an echo. Um, there was a 10 code even for that. So use the plain English, not the 10 codes. And a lot of that comes to, as we talk about the triage and multiple agencies being involved in the same response that you'll see that and why that comes in to be huge. Because what the 10 code, what we found of the 10 code in Louisiana versus what the 10 code in Utah was or in New York, whatever, there was different numbers and very, um, and inevitably it caused a lot of confusion. Um, don't use phrases such as be advised, right? It's implied if you're going on the radio and talking to them, they, you're giving them some kind of information. Um, Courtesy is assumed, so there's no need to say the please and thank you. It's the same thing, trying to stay off um, unless it's needed. So if other units need to call in, that the channel is open for them. 
um, when transmitting things that might be clear, like 15 or 16 or 50, give the number and then repeat with the individuals. So if you say 15, one, five, 15, just repeat it that way. Um, the other thing too, is if you're getting a direction, like let's say we had to call over to the hospital or have dispatch call over to the hospital, get directions on like a specific drug or dosage or something like that. Um, make sure that they dispatch repeats that back to you and breaks it down in two ways say the number whole and then break it down by individual digit. Um, you would be shocked and amazed at how many people have a scanner in your communities um, and that are listening to everything that goes on. So use objective statements. Um, it's the same thing over the radio because of that. We never give a patient's name, age, well, you can give, it's just the name that's a lot. And a lot of the times, if it's not information that's needed, that being said, like a lot of the times a hospital does need to know a date of birth and an age, they can to pull up some of their stuff and start that, but we never give the name with it. And even that on the date of birth stuff, a lot of the times it's better to call in on a cell phone on something that's secure. Because I bet you in this area, there's five out of the, five out of 10, or five out of, 20 houses have a scanner. Either they do fire, they have a scanner for another reason. You can get apps on your phone even now that will be a scanner for you. So there's a lot of people listening. Okay. Um, use we instead of I as an EMT. Um, you'll be rarely acting alone. And it's the same thing. If somebody hears, well, I did that on the radio and then um, something happens, then all of a sudden it's getting out that oh, well, you killed them or you did that alone or you didn't have a crew or whatever. People just twist it so very often, okay? Um, affirmative and negative are preferred over yes or no because they're um, difficult to hear, okay? Give assess some information, but avoid offering field diagnosis of the patient's problem. So complaints of abdominal pain rather than the patient probably has appendicitis. It's the same thing. People are listening, and before you even get to the hospital, now 10 other people are going to know, oh, they have appendicitis or they have whatever it may be. Um, avoid using slang or abbreviations that are not authorized. So like a BVM, that's an, obviously an authorized one, OP, OPA, MPA, all those ones that we talk about in class that way are obviously, are, those are an approved abbreviation. But like for us at the mine, doing my job in surveying, EOM for us means end of month. But EOM to somebody else has, can have a very different meaning in their field. So unless it's, unless it's a clear abbreviation, like CPAP, BiPAP, OPA, MPAs, all of those, those ones are great. You can use those. Um, but just kind of think through that too. Um, use EMS frequencies for authorized EMS communication. Goes back to the same thing. We want to keep this line open. Um, so if there's another emergency or another unit needs to call in, they can. Um, the initial call often comes through a telephone, but may be radioed in for um, from another agency. Um, so that's your right. So the initial calls come, and that's not our call, meaning somebody else has to call into your base station and call it, and then it goes out. So a lot of the times it gets really hard um, what dispatch tells you, and then when you get on scene are very, very different, far often, um, and it's hard not to get frustrated with dispatch. But the thing to remember is, is that they're only giving you the information that they were given. So garbage in, garbage out. If they're not getting the correct information, they can't give you the correct information, okay? But without their prompt and efficient um, receipt of the information, obviously, guys, it, it can kind of be a mess. We had the one time 
couple, I don't know, it was a year and a couple of years ago now that for some reason our base stations, our repeaters went down. And so they dispatch was frantically calling people that they knew in the ambulance to see, to get cell phone numbers and things like that. And for whatever freaking reason, when they went down, all of a sudden all hell broke loose and six hours into it, we had all three ambulances, two or three fire departments out. And it was just, <laughs> just in the north end of the county. I can't even tell you what was happening in Manti or Gunnison, but I know the north end of the county, when they went down, all of a sudden it was just a freaking disaster. So um, they do a great job with what they are given. They do have a lot of training and just remember um, garbage in, garbage out. They can only give you what they are given to. Um, as we start doing these two, though, we deal with the 24 hour clock just to eliminate the AM PM part of it for paging and things too. Um, some things that you guys need to note in your documentation though. So time of the original call, time the ambulance was dispatched, time you reached the staging area, if you had to stage and then when you arrived on scene. The other thing you'll listen to with them um, is so they'll say, you'll say, um, Sam Pete, this is 1Q503, we're in route. They'll come back, 1Q503, Sam Pete, um, in route at 2142. If you have somebody, um, we have a couple drivers that are really, really great to listen to transmissions and document those times. Um, if not, a lot of the times we can call down to dispatch and they can, they have a CAD system that um, records all of their information to when they tra transmit it out. Um, Many transmissions, the same thing, are between the mobile and within the ambulance and the dispatcher at the base station. Uh, most of the time that is, as far as radio communication anymore, that pretty much is all we use them for is just to talk so dispatch knows where we're at and can give us more information. Um, the days of carrying the portables um, to respond and all of that at home for a volunteer service or are gone just because of the expense of the radios. So your average radio is around $1,200 now by the time you get it programmed and make sure it's one that works. So they're just an expensive deal that way too. That being said though, if you like your, most of your paid services, if you leave, you have to carry a radio with you. Um, and they have a panic button and things on them too. So, I mean, that is a great, um, it's a great tool to have. Um, a lot of the times they're just cost inhibitive for a volunteer service. Even the paid service, like the ones that I worked with up in Wyoming, we had three radios that at the end of our shift, we had six or eight batteries and we just switch out batteries. So at the end of my shift, I would give it to the next oncoming uh, medic just so that we didn't have to have 12 or 15 radios. So um, just something to consider as we do that. But the reason they want you to carry it whenever you leave the unit is if something happens, in theory, you should be able to call out to dispatch, say, hey, the scene is no longer safe. We need assistance um, that way, too. So, oh, um, radio medical records. Um, so you can report must be given to the destination hospital so they can prepare for your arrival. Um, most of them now are, they're either verbal or maybe given by radio, verbally in person, writing, or, or in all three ways. So a lot of the times before we ever get, um, to the hospital, we've already made a call. Hey, we're 10 minutes out. This is what we have with the patient. Here's his last set of vitals. Can you have lab ready for us? Or can you get x-ray coming in? Whatever we need that way for the next treatment too. If you're having to do it over the radio though, just remember um, to stick to the most important words, try and keep it at 30 seconds at a time and no names given over the radio. 
because those scanners will scan that just as much as they'll scan your pages too. And you want to paint a picture of what you're seeing with the patient in words. Be descriptive. You know, he's pale, he's cool, he's cold, um, having a heart attack. He's in the tripoding position, obviously having difficulty breathing. Um, we've done X, Y, and Z for this patient. Um, whatever we need to that way. So this is how they truly are given most of the time now. Um, through the cell phone, you'll see the, the EMT, um, the tablet in front of them with this information on it. So you want to give them the unit number. So a lot of the times it is a number just like that. We have 503, 500, 504, all of those in our, in our county. We want the estimated time of arrival, patient's age and sex, chief complaint, pre brief history, and then a major past illness. Their mental status, not only their baseline. So this one says baseline vitals, but also the most current set of vitals. So if we've had this patient for 15 or 20 minutes and we're on our second or third, um, given the baseline and the most current too. Um, emergency care given, and then the response to it. And then if you have a metal, so for you guys, for the basic and for the purposes of the test, um, it's always a patient assist and you have to have medical directions to do any of it. So kind of remember that for your test questions too. Um, so contact them if you have a question. And as you guys hopefully move through and move on to other levels this um, through EMS, hopefully you guys will um, look at it too. And um, don't think that just because you're a paramedic or an advanced or whatever it is that you are above calling medical control, because that's usually what gets you in trouble. Um, we want to run this as a team. And if we need to bring in uh, medical direction as part of our team, then we're going to do that. It's not about our pride, it's about the patient care. Um, so communicating with medical direction, give information clearly and ac accurately, avoid receiving an order or denial for medication or procedure, repeat back or after receiving, excuse me. And we've kind of hit on this. So you're gonna wanna repeat it back word for word, okay? Um, I had one that got me in trouble with that, that I asked for, X amount of a drug. Um, when I get, they went to another paramedic. It was an advanced. They says we need X amount of drug. They misheard it. He brought it back. I didn't ask him to repeat how much, and neither the medic didn't repeat. So there was just a chain of breakdown. Anyway, we overdosed him, and instead of doing pain management, we sedated him. So breathed for him, bagged him for five or ten minutes, and it wore off. But really repeat it word for word for word for word, okay? Um, if unclear, there's no, those guys can put aside their pride and can repeat the freaking order back to you too. Um, if it seems inappropriate, you question the physician. You guys are the patient advocate. They're your patient. Um, obviously, if something happened, the physician's going to get drug in with it too, but they're your patient and you're going to also be right there, especially if you had an idea that it was an inappropriate intervention or treatment. The verbal report. Um, you guys make sure and practice this because this is a critical fail on your medical patient assessment. If you don't give the verbal report to either the ALS team coming on or if you're at a hospital, you have to give it to the ED staff. So just so you guys know, this is a critical fail and you'll have to do this with every medical assessment. The trauma, for whatever reason, is not part of it, but it is part of the medical. So it's given upon arrival at the destination, introduce the patient by name. Um, also, most hospitals would like a date of birth, but a lot of the times that's given in the report when you're given in the ETA so they can have their medical records um, all of that pulled up and start to review the patient information before you ever get there. Um, give a complete and detailed report. 
and it needs to include the following. Um, chief complaint history that was not given previously, meaning if there's, there's some more medical history in the, that doesn't necessarily seem pertinent at the time um, to, his, uh, to his whatever's ailing him, we're still gonna give that just so the physician, he may find some pertinence in it that we missed. Um, we're going to give the assessment of what we've seen, our treatments, right? Our reassessment is the other term for that one that we just talked about, Whether our reass what our reassessment showed us, and then additional vital signs taken in route. Now, that doesn't mean that if we took somebody to Utah Valley and we have an unstable patient taking it every five minutes, you're going to have 15 sets of vitals. They don't need to know all 15 unless there was a change halfway through and you've seen a distinct change in vitals, the baseline and where you're at now. If the physician wants more of them, by all means, we can give them that, but um, you don't need to list them all off to them either. Oh, and then the fun one, we gotta communicate and talk as a team, okay? And this one's hard because most of the time, the people that get into, um, not most of them, but there are a lot of alpha personalities in AMS and an alpha and an alpha um, clash, clash a lot. And that's not only in EMS. It's like we're talking here, home health care, nurses, doctors, they're usually an alpha too. So you've got to learn how to communicate with each other, put aside your... Um, I don't know how to say that. Put aside your pride for a minute and just realize it's patient care. Um, so we are involved with the patient, first responders, advanced paramedics, home health and family. Um, we do need to be able to speak candidly too, but we can be candid and respectful at the same time. Gather the information about the patient, complete any necessary and appropriate transfer of care. Um, and that goes back to like we talked on that it's just because something doesn't seem pertinent to, to you it still needs to get passed on because somebody may find that useful information down the road or we may end up going down a different treatment or diagnosis tree too that all of a sudden that would be really important to know um, also too when you're doing a handoff, let's say you guys are the first responders and basics and you arrive on scene and you're starting treatment and an advanced crew either intercepts with you or meets you on scene, um, be respectful to those and list it all out to gather whatever, pass on whatever information you had about the patient, um, especially if it refers, if it's gonna be needed for patient care. Unfortunately, experience is usually our best talk, right? Um, maybe more difficult. And I, let's just take away the maybe. It's going to be more difficult in situations of crisis. Meaning if all of a sudden we're coming in and um, for you guys that know the service, there's, when we first started in North Champaign, there was three of us that did our paramedic and we were responding to calls. Well, the three of us had worked together and it was nothing for us to raise our voices and yell back and forth. We weren't yelling at, at each other. We were just yelling to each other. For us, it was just normal. Now, when we started responding to other ambulances and other crews, all of a sudden they thought we were just angry and mad all the time. It's like, no, I yell at Tracy and Brian all the time in a scene. I'm not mad at them. I'm just yelling at them, not to them. So a lot of the times, though, you're going to have to remember who your audience is. Um, and when you get in a stressful situation, that's the hardest time. And we don't rise to the occasion with those, right? We fall to our training. So a lot of it in those easier situations, practice how you want to communicate what your expectations and understand who your personnel are with. So if you're running with two men, um, a lot of the times we tend to be louder. We are more aggressive than a female. So, but if you're running with two or three females on the crew and you're a male and you get aggressive, you could create problems that way. And it's the same thing too, that just, just because you're a female or 
pat, let's not even say sex, but passive versus aggressive. Um, if you're seeing something and your nature is a lot of the times to be passive, but you, that treatment needs to happen, you're going to have to learn tips and ways to be more aggressive to communicate that on so that that treatment, you're the advocate for that patient. Okay. Um, if you guys get a chance on this, you know, skills by learning um, effective communication techniques, um, a lot of the conferences that we have in um, around here and training ones, they, there's a lot of them on communication techs and um, tips and techniques that way. Um, take the time and go through those. They're really great to kind of help you learn how to have a dy dynamic, not only with your crew, but also it helps at home. Um, therapeutic communication too. Now this is when we're talking to the patient. So we're going to use eye contact. Um, be aware of your body position. If somebody's standing over, so for me, I have to be aware of this. I'm already taller and a male. So if I'm coming in and I have somebody that's sitting in the chair or on a couch and I'm talking to them and looking down on them, does that give them um, a sense of calm or peace or do they feel a little defensive? They're going to be defensive and intimidated. Yeah. So your body language and position that way. So face the patient at arm level with, um, so get at eye level with them. Okay. Um, and then that's the same thing too. If you're standing there with your arms folded, looking back with this angry scowl on your face, do they think you care about them or what's happening there? Okay. And a lot of the times, is that necessarily what we think? but that's what our body position um, is showing the patient. So you got to be aware of that when we start dealing with these guys. So for me, what I always say is we're going to do just like this picture. Um, the EMT here is at eye level with the patient. He's not in an aggressive stance. Um, and just talking through with them, okay? Especially like this one is an elderly, and it comes the same thing too, is an elderly person and a child are going to respond the same way to somebody standing over them. Unfortunately, yes, they, they, it goes back to the extreme ages. So get down to the child's level, get down to your patient's level. Okay. And if you do it with every patient, then when it comes to the child or it comes to somebody that's really um, predisposed to be intimidated, you're already, that's your habit. And it just comes and you don't have to think about it you get down to their level to their eye and then you can talk through with them okay you know this guy's holding um, the patient's hand just to give them some kind of comfort as you're talking to them if you're holding their hand looking at them eye to eye they know that you care about them and they know that you're listening to them okay um, use a language the patient can understand there's a lot of times too when we go to the the ER or transfer patient to a specialty, um, the, the doctor will say terms and stuff that you're going, okay, like I, I know that made sense to you, but nothing what you just said made sense to me. So let's dumb this down a little, okay? So patients are the same way. We may understand the medical terms, but they have no idea what you're talking about. And so instead of, oh, you've got an arterial bleed that's spurting, you've got a bleed that we're going to have to take care of. Or um, you're having a myocardial infarction. It's a heart attack. Okay, so you've got to break it down to them and explain the procedures. And this really does come into play with kids. Um, explain the procedures and be honest with them. If it's going to hurt because they have a broken arm and we're splinting it, it's going to hurt. If you're starting an IV or you're helping with the advanced start an IV, it's going to hurt. If you tell them it's not and then it does, you automatically ruin their confidence and rapport and the trust with them. And in the short amount of time that we have with these patients, you'll never get it back. Okay. I know in the medical legal ethic part two in the first couple chapters, there was a lot of questions on, um, you know, if, if the patient's going to die, or has a good chance of it, what do you do? Do you lie to them or do you tell them we're going to do everything we can, but this isn't good? Okay. They know and you're going to lose that confidence and rapport with them. And a lot of the times too, when we start looking at 
um, lawsuits and stuff that happened down the road. Um, you could screw up royally, but if you had their confidence and rapport, chances are you'll never hear from them. Now, if you lost their confidence and rapport, there's a really good chance that you're going to spend a lot of time either dealing with fallout from the community, legal part of it, um, confidence in the ambulance service. Because the other thing too, do they just lose confidence in you or the system? A lot of the times it goes back to the system. So they, they don't trust the call 911 again. They don't trust um, the next time, whether you're the EMT responding on it again or not. Um, they've lost that rapport and confidence and can take a long time to get it back. Um, use the patient's proper name, um, especially it's a sign of respect and especially with older patients. Now, that being said, if you say, you know, Mrs. Chatwin, what can we do to help you today? And you say, no, I'm like, my name's Elizabeth, okay? Or Liz or whatever you prefer. Don't keep calling in whatever name if they give you a name that they would prefer to be called, then stick to that. Obviously, we're going to use the proper name until they say, oh, this is what I go by. Okay. Um, and listen, it is an important part to establish trust. And we've already talked that way, too. Um. So some special considerations too. Always be compassionate and respectful with the patient, especially if they have, um, and we're going to hit on both of these. So, or all three of these and some tips and tricks that I found through the years, you guys can take them and use them, whether you have wanted or not. A lot of the times with a mentally disabled person, they will latch onto one person in the crew. If they do, and they find that person and they're capable, meaning that it can't be a bystander by all means. Um, but if they are somebody in the crew that they can communicate with more easily, then we're going to hand over a lot of the communication to them. A lot of the times with them, understand they may not understand even if you break it down to layman's terms on what you're saying. So you're going to have to either get um, inventive on how to explain to them what we're going to have happen um, and understand that they're just as frustrated as you are. The other thing too, if, so we had to, one of my rotations, you have to do um, 36 hours in a psych lab. And we were up at, uh, um, I, I did a dog in regional. And we had the, the chief psychiatrist came in the one day and I just asked her, um, it was a lady, I says, how do you handle um, these patients a lot of the times that they, they're pretty sure that they need to leave, that they're whatever. Um, and she says, well, let me share an example with you. Had a lady um, that was suffering from a mental illness and had had a breakdown and Ogden Fire was called. Well, up in Salt Lake area in Ogden, they also, if it is a psych call or a mental disability that they know that they're coming to, a lot of the times they will page. Um, I can't remember what the program is called now, but they'll send out a mental health worker or a social worker with them. And she was paged to this. And this gal was pretty sure that she needed to be in Oklahoma um, and that she was going to start walking there. The problem was it was the middle of December. She was in shorts and a uh, camisole, just a spaghetti strap, and trying to walk down Ogden Main Street because she was going to, uh, it was Oklahoma for whatever reason. Um, and she says, well, you know, a lot of the times you have to kind of play into their help so you can get them to a facility that can truly help them. So she says for her, like we didn't have the way she needed to come in, get evaluated, get back on her medications, and then we could deal with it. So she said, you know, talk them through it. So for her, she says, oh, well, what do you got to go to Oklahoma for? And I can't remember the reason. She says, well, do you need some clothes and food? Like it's, it's dinner time. Why don't we go get you some different clothes and some food and we'll kind of help you get ready. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that'd, that'd probably be good. Um well, let's go in the ambulance. We'll go get you some clothes, some food. And, and what about your medications? Do you have all of that? Oh, no. And, you know, she kind of played into it. And she says a lot of the times 
you don't want to lie to them, but if you can use that as, oh, well, if you're going to do that, why don't we better get this too? Um, but the one thing that she said, and I witnessed it in the psych lab on that rotation too, is you have to be very careful with them because they can be manipulative and their moods can shift slightly and not slightly, but pretty dramatically quickly. So we were sitting there playing cards, um, with a couple of them. And I noticed one of the patients in the back grabbed the pencil. Now, when you guys usually hold the pencil, it's between two fingers, like we're going to write. Okay. He had it between all four fingers around it with his thumb over the eraser with the point sticking out about two inches. Are we writing with that? Or is that now a weapon? <laughs> Guess whose back was to the patient, the other nurse on the, the, on there. And so I just, when I saw that, I just says, Hey, I can't remember his name. I want to say Mike, but it, it could have been something different at this point. I was over at another table. And I says, Hey, I got a question for you on the cards games. I, I don't understand this. And he says, Oh, okay. He says, you got a second. I says, no, I, I really need you to come over and, and help me explain this. Cause I didn't want to bring it to the patient that I'd seen it. And we'd kind of decide, and you could see the light click on his head as he come over and he says, Oh, what is it? And I says, well, come here. I'll, I'll whisper it in your ear. And because I don't want to let the other players know what I'm trying to ask you. Told them what it was, and we were able to talk um, patient down and get the pencil out of his hands. So there's a lot of it. You just have got to be respectful of it. Take the opportunities to go to these seminars and learn how to handle them because they, they pose their own challenge. Um, somebody that has visual or hearing impairments, a lot of the times you'll find somebody with um, hearing impairments when you talk to them, if they have one side or the better, one side is better than the other for hearing, what do they do? They turn to you. So which side do you want to be on when you're communicating? Whichever side's the best, okay? Um, and just understand that if they have their head turned away from you, listening to somebody else and you ask them a question, there's a really good chance they may not hear you or understand you. So watch for those cues. The same with somebody that has a visual impairment. Um, if they're near or farsighted, you'll watch them as they try and see things. So you're going to try and position things. Same thing. If they're nearsighted, you don't want to be, or, you know, if they see better close, you don't want to be far away. Or if they don't see very well close and they need a little bit of, try and find that space where they can see better too. Um, if they have language barriers for us in this County, um, and a lot of the times it's Spanish, we have a large Spanish and, but we're also getting a fairly large, Tongan and um, Samoan population too. Um, a lot of the times there are apps on your phone. Um, IHC for all of us um, has a interpreter that you can call in and ask him. The patient can tell him whatever language it is, and then they we can get an interpreter online too for us. Okay. Um, otherwise, a lot of the times we're going to have to use nonverbal communication and try and show or explain what we're going to do um, until we can get uh, an interpreter of some kind. Pediatrics, we've already kind of talked on this, come down to the level and be truthful with them. Oh, goody, the PCR. So it's a written documentation of what happened during the call. There's several forms of them. Oh my gosh. The handwritten ones, what I'm telling you guys, they're pretty well gone unless it's an MS, a mass casualty incident that we have multiple patients that we're filling out um, refusals and things on them. Otherwise, it's on a laptop or tablet. Right. Even the pen based computers, um, other than for signatures, a lot of those are, excuse me, are gone as well. Then we're going to have the drop or transfer report too. Um, all of those goes into a, so for us, like we use um, Polaris for the state of Utah. So all of these reports get dropped and then transferred to a report into that Polaris. And it's where we're using our, we've truly become an evidence-based um, science now because we're looking at hundreds of thousands of reports and seeing what's working and what's not. So we found a lot of things that we thought were working that truly aren't. 
and we found a lot of things that we didn't think would work that are. So they do get into that um, report on most states now. Um, there's also a financial incentive. They get money from the federal or like AHA or these big agencies that use it for research. So there's also money that gets kicked back to the state for that. So the patient care record, it's documented in the findings and treatment. So if you see it or if you did it, you got to write it down. We're going to paint a picture of the scene um, with words again in this. And remember, though, it is a permanent medical record and who can have access to it? Patient. They can request it at any time. So that being said, um, if you've seen it, if you heard it, eh, did it. It's got to be documented. Um, it is a legal document. Can and will be, can and be subpoenaed into court for how many years? Up to seven years. Okay. Uh, may help a patient win a case. Hopefully that's uh, not a case of negligence against you, but it may help them win a case. It also has the administrative data. Um, unfortunately, in our line of work, it's cost money to do this, so we have to have the insurance information and then a billing address in it too. Let's see if it. The other part of the administrative data too that I'll add to this one, um, it has to have their sex and age because that also plays huge in the Polaris. So female versus male, and then the age of the patient. And that goes into this education and research part too, though. So the clinical research, we already talked, AHA is our big one as far as um, cardiac arrest. We track statistics, one state versus the other. And a lot of the times we're looking at those statistics. Um, on So let's say Wyoming does this for cardiac arrest. Well, Oregon does this, California does this, Utah does this. So who's statistically having the greater outcome or the more positive outcome? So we'll track that statistically too. We use it for continuing education. When I was a training officer and helping with that, a lot of the times I'd look back through reports and say, oh, we've had some issues with identifying BTAC, BFib, or wrong dosages, or not giving a medication when we should have. So that was what I would use to guide where I wanted to do training and teaching. Um, and then it's tracking the EMT's personnel experience. Um, and a lot of the times, too, the state requires some of that. Like as you get in advance, you have to be able to prove that you've done so many IVs, so many airways, blah, 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 um, to get your license renewed. Quality improvement, so it's a routine column view. It ensures the standards, make sure we meet the protocols. Um, and then it's the same thing too. This kind of goes back to can reveal the um, providers deserving special resignation or also can reveal the opportunities for improvement. So it can go both ways. And a lot of the times, I, you know, most of the time as you deal with training officers and quality improvement, the QI officers, what they're usually called, um, they're not looking at it as a disciplinary action or something to discipline you. It's an opportunity for improvement, an opportunity for training is what we're looking at it as. Some other elements too. Um, so for these guys, remember NTAS, NTSA is the one that governs us, um, has more than 400 elements and a minimum data set na available nationwide, meaning not every call is the same, but we have to be able to put it into different elements to be able to track it. Um, so it's they're the ones that sat down and said the elements and um, the minimum we also have to have to track it. So if we didn't have an age or a sex or a chief complaint or 
a diagnosis, it's pretty hard to track any of it because we don't know where to start throwing this, okay? So they also set the elements and then the minimum set of data that we have to have per report. So some things that they're saying that we have to have is run data. Um, it comes back to the agency name, date, times. I mean, they're looking at this too at one o'clock versus 11 o'clock, what's the better response or urban versus rural, um, you, unit personnel. So how many people are on it, our level of certification and then other basic information mandated by the service, meaning our, um, like for us, we, we have to track mileage and things like that too, that has to be on the run data because that's how we bill. Okay. Um, use the official time given by dispatch so that the times and the reports match. So if you guys get audited or you get subpoenaed, not audited, but you get subpoenaed, they're not only subpoenaing your records, but they can subpoena the dispatch records and we don't want them to not match. Okay. Some other things, um, name, address, phone number, age, date of birth. Um, same thing, race or ethnicity. Um, we're finding that different ethnicities are, with our tracking, respond differently to different treatments um, and in a far greater number than what we anticipated when we were um, treating it. So it has been kind of cool that we've went to these reports because we do get to see that information and see what our treatments are doing. Um, information gathered at the call, so your general impression of the patient. Now, remember, that needs to be yours and your crew's as well. Um, the narrative or the summary of the call. Um, a lot of the times, it, it needs to have all the pertinent information, short and to the point. Um, patient's prior aid, meaning if they were did anything for treatment, past medical history, exam, so your ECG results if there's an ALS procedures and treatments, medications, and other information. And then the transport information, where did we take them to? Um, was it Utah Valley, Sappy Valley? And then usually mileage with that too. So in the narrative too, it has um, two different parts and we've kind of hit on this too. So objective is observable, measurable, and verifiable. Meaning that any person can observe it, measure it, and verify it. Subjective is usually an inter interpretation or opinion, and it's usually often reported by um, the patient. So what's a sign? Is it objective or subjective? So a, a sign is objective, and then symptoms are usually subjective because it's their opinion or interpretation of what they're seeing. Okay. It also needs to have the chief complaint. Um, it's usually stated by the patient or a bystander if they're unresponsive. Um, and then it's best recorded when you do it as a direct quote. So put it in quotations as you document it so that we know that this is word for word what the patient said was wrong with them. The other one that a lot of the times gets missed is pertinent negatives, meaning we didn't find an airway problem. We didn't find something wrong with the heart. Um, we didn't find any major bleeding. We didn't find any ne neck pain. Um, so pertinent negatives are there too. Not only it gives the care provider or the QI officer an idea of where your thought process was with it. Okay. And then they know part of it. Oh, well, they did check this. It was negative. So that's why they went down the route they did. And six years from now, when you read that report and you wondering well why did i do that treatment oh because this and this and this was a negative so my pertinent negatives are what guided me there um narrative sections to array avoid radio codes and non-standard abbreviations we've kind of hit that too um write legibly and use correct spelling thank goodness most of it's done on a tablet and computer with spell check because that would not happen with me um, information must be read easily and accurately. Same thing. Thank goodness we're doing it on a computer. And most importantly, though, guys, the PCR is a reflection of your care because ultimately somebody that's going to look at it and when it, if it ever goes to a court of law, 
that's what they're looking at is what your patient, what your care was for this patient. They don't look at, they can't pick apart your brain if it wasn't documented and written in a way that's favorable. It's not going to be viewed favorably. Um, and these times, though, we are going to want to use the pro appropriate medical terminology. Um, if the patient subpoenas a record and wants to see it and doesn't understand it, then they can come and ask. But for the reports, it does need to have the appropriate medical terminology. And we've hit this one already, hopefully hard and long, but if it wasn't written down, you didn't do it. And if you didn't do it, don't write it down. So some special document uh, documentation issues that we're gonna hit on. It is a legal, document but it also is confidential and secure health information um, and it is covered by HIPAA um, that is how do I put this that is the biggest security and also the biggest pain in the butt for us once you leave that if they weren't on the call or involved in it it is confidential and it shouldn't be shared with anybody else. The only one that we can get away with that with is training. If we say, well, we're using it for training. But even at that, uh, most of the time when I share it, you'll find I don't share names um, and some of that too, to try and keep that confidential, even though I'm using it for training, which is okay and legal. Um, the one that is just, the patient refusals, they're not wrong on that. They are a high liability. Um, those ones you definitely want to document, dot your T's, cross your I's, meaning that you're going to want to document. If you told them, you know, if this and this happens, call us again. Um, they share any of the that conversation that you had with them that, this is what we think is happening. This is what could happen if you don't get treatment. If you see this, you're more than welcome to call us back. Um, go through all of that with them. And then try and get them to sign it after you've read it or written it out. So a lot of the times refusals are um, on a paper sheet just because they're faster to fill out. If somebody's refusing care, they don't want to wait five or 10 minutes for you to get all of it into the computer. Um, to even get a signature for them or to review it. Just make sure it's documented. If you can't get them to sign it, try and get a bystander or somebody that witnessed you say that to them. Um, and if they won't sign it, see if you can find two, whether that's law enforcement or bystander. Unless it's a last resort, you just don't want anybody on the ambulance crew we don't want to be signing as a witness saying they refused, if at all possible. Because the courts can turn that easily. Oh, well, you you really didn't say that to him. You guys are just covering your butts. So we are covering our butts. We're not signing it. We want at least, at least one other signature, if not witnessed by two non-EMS personnel. Um, falsification. If you screwed up, don't cover it up. You will be in far more trouble with your medical director, with the law, with all of it. If you screwed up, document what um, document what you did and what you saw with the patient and report it so that it, it's always seen more favorable if it's not covered up. And the recording something, if you didn't do it and you didn't observe it, um, don't record it just because if you forgot to do it, you forgot to do it, but record it as such. Um, so there are correction and errors, so mistakes and documentation. If you're doing it in handwritten, um, draw a single line through it so that it can still be read what the original was and then make a correction on another sheet or further down on the page. Never erase or black it out to where it's not legible again. Um, a lot of the times with the computer reports, once you submit them, 
they're, we call it a locked or uneditable at that point. And then you have to do an addendum to it um, to make the correction or an addition. Most of, the, most of your programs will call it an addendum though, not an addition. So you respond to a call for an unconscious male. Upon arrival, the patient's awake, alert, and walking away. He states he was just sleeping and does not need or want treatment or transport. Okay, so there's our scenario. Is, is this a patient? Not a willing patient, but he was there. Okay, so he would be, he could technically be a patient. Is a complete assessment and physical exam needed? So he's walking, he's alert. Um, there's nothing that says I, he has an altered LOC. Is it wanted? And I guess a lot of the times you got to, it's hard to distinguish between what we'd want to do and what necessarily needs to be done. Would we want to do an assessment on this guy if he would allow us to? But do you see anything with that that, admit, that says that it's needed at the time? Okay. That's a hard, gray area. So I, I agree with you guys on that. Nothing that, that's showing to me that it's needed. Would I like to do one? Yes. And a lot of the times um, you could you can talk through them and say, hey, look, like we're not going to charge you anything. We're not going to do anything, but hey, can we just do a quick um, physical assessment, make sure everything's good? If you're, if you're okay with that, we'd like to do that. We'll document it, and you can get on your way, okay? Um, a lot of the times, if you approach it to them that way, they're more than willing to let you do the assessment um, unless they, like a DUI or something like that, that they or an injury that they don't want to be seen because it's not, the injury doesn't fit the story, which would never happen, but just saying it might, okay? Um, so documenting this call, this is gonna be a refusal. So we're gonna write it down. Hey, the patient was, patient was awake, alert, walking around. He stated that he was just sleeping, doesn't want treatment, appeared to have an open airway. We inform the patient if something changes, he starts to have difficulty breathing, dizzy, um, unable, if spouse or somebody is unable to arouse him, that he needs to call 911 um, and inform them of that. Um, if, and document all of that, a lot of the times, even with the physical exam, hey, can we just hurry and do a set of vitals on you? I'm not gonna treat you just, just for my documentation. We just wanna make sure that everything's okay. Um, try and get that on and say, hey, all right, everything looks good. You're all right. Um, if something changes, let us know. And if you're willing, could you sign this refusal? Okay. A lot of the times it really does come down to how you approach it with them. And it'll be the same thing on a refusal or on any of them, especially on a refusals, though you'll find one person on the crew by far is easier, can communicate with them easier. If you find somebody that can do that, by all means, let them be the one that handles that. The refusal will go a lot smoother. So mass casualty incidents, a lot of the times in your book and the test, they'll call them MCIs. For whatever reason, that is an accepted abbreviation that they use. So mass casualty incidents, um, so an MCI, and I wish they had this definition in it too. A mass casualty incident is any incident that overwhelms the EMS logistics or resources. So if we have all but one of the, or two of the ambulances out in the county on other calls and we have a car wreck with four patients, it's an MCI, right? We overrun the logistics that we have in this area that are available to us at the time. Now let's say every ambulance in the county is in service and we have a bus roll that had 42 patients or 42 people in it. It doesn't matter. We've got 10 ambulances, 42 patients. All of a sudden we've overwhelmed the resources and logistics that we have available to us. 
So just because it's not a specific number of patients, it's just when you read the question, it's got to overrun their logistics or resources that they have. They are a logistical problem for EMS, right? We've got to, and we're going to spend a lot of time on triaging in these um, and further chapters in and on the hands-on stuff. Um, we're going to try and do the most good for the most people we can. Um, a lot of the times documenting that on somebody that was having um, difficulty, you know, that was agonal breathing or in respiratory arrest. And we have three other patients that need some kind of care that we can save or has a highly likelihood of being saved. A lot of the times the resources are going there. It's an ethical one of those calls that it is we're trying to do the most good for the most people we can with the resources we have. And then we're going to have to document afterwards. Now, if you had 42 patients and we were doing a quick head to toe on all of them, are you going to necessarily remember name, all their names, ages? Okay. So a lot of the times when we come down um, documentation for individual patients, it's, it can be difficult. Um, for two different, for that, because we have multiple. And a lot of the times we'll, we'll set up what we call triage areas. And that can be in different areas by different providers at different times and locations. Because we'll triage them once, then we'll re-triage what's left. Then we'll re-triage again, re-triage again until we can get them all shipped out and moved with the resources we have. Um, so that patient may be seen by several providers at different times and locations as we move them from one area to the other. Um, it's important to keep the information with the patient of, of an MCI as they move through the system. So we have triage tags that will go with them. We'll try and put their name, date of birth, anything we found, or a brief set of vitals if possible, and any treatments we did. And that's it. Okay. And then a lot of the times with those, it gets tied to their wrist um, so that we know this is what's happened. It's with this patient, and it stays there until they hit definitive care at a hospital. And a lot of the times, even the hospitals will use them because they're doing the same thing. It's like if we had 42 patients, Sampe Valley has a hospital, an ER of, I think there's eight beds with a, or five with a possibility of overflow to eight. Um, and even if we use some of the floors with rooms, which we have at times with MCIs, <coughs> they don't have 42 beds. So they're going to have to triage and do the most good they can for what resources they have there again, too. Um, so, you know, the different locations, they, they're going to be calling in helicopters, multiple helicopters, if we can get multiple agencies, even if that means getting other counties, Gold Cross, whoever that may be, to try and transport these people out. It gets chaotic, and those tags will stay with them. Just so as they move through we have some idea of what's happened, okay? Um, some other special situations as far as reporting, if you guys were exposed to an infectious disease, meaning like a, if you had a needle stick or blood that got in a cut because of a ripped glove, if they had tuberculosis or whatever it may be, um, we have to report those too. Um, injury to yourself or another EMT, um, that's a workman's comp, has to be reported and documented. If for some reason we went to a hazardous or unsafe scene, um, we have to document that, especially if the scene changed from a safe to an unsafe, or there was hazardous stuff there that presented itself after we were there, or let's say we didn't ever actually go on scene because it was a hazardous scene, you're still going to have to document that on why we didn't or why the scene was safe and no longer was a safe scene, or we didn't go in because they were continuing to have gunfire at the residence um, and police never could get it secured for us. So you're gonna have to document that. Um, referrals to social service agencies, um, meaning, and a lot of the times those turn down to the child or elderly abuse. Um, and then the other one is if you um, suspect sexual abuse, you have to report it. Um, 
a lot of the times we think of child abuse. Um, the one that we're seeing, in my opinion, far too many lately is we're seeing a lot of elderly abuse, especially with the cost of like nursing homes, special care, all those people just can't afford it. And they're bringing mom, dad, aunt, uncle, and they're living in some pretty atrocious conditions that frankly are abusive. Um, if you find those scenes, you're going to have to report them. And it's just, we'll talk more on this in pre later chapters too, but if you suspect it, and it's, by all means, if you are for sure of it, but if you suspect it, you have to report it. For us, you can report it to law, local law enforcement or you can report it to the ER when you hand off patient care. All righty. Let's take... 10 and we'll start back up at um, 
get this unmuted and shared with you guys and we'll get going. Come on. All right, here we go. So we're going to talk a little bit about general pharmacology today now to finish off the night. So some topics, we're going to um, cover some medications you guys can administer. Um, your EMT assisting with prescribed medication and then general information about medications and then assisting with IV therapy. So for you guys, medications you guys can administer on the ambulance. You guys that have aspirin or glucose oxygen. We talk about activated charcoal, but to be honest with you, the state of Utah has taken it out of our protocol. Um, we'll go over it a little bit. It's not one that we're going to spend any time in class with. We don't carry it on the ambulances. It's just not that as effective anymore. And the new one that we've added to the list, though, is naloxone or Narcan. So aspirin, the baby, what we're going to be giving, um, it's going to be administered to a patient with chest pain and of suspected cardiac origin. If you guys will notice on it too, it's um, a children's or a aspirin or a chewable aspirin. It's not a normal adult aspirin. The reason why is it's the makeup of it. It's designed to get into your bloodstream faster um, in a children's versus an adult. So that's why we use that one. Um, oral glucose, most of the time you'll see it in that glucose 45 in a tube that way. Um, it's used with patients with diabetes. Um, low blood sugar, though, is when we're going to give it, not with high. Um, that transcend 15 grams of glucose um, is another one, but most of the time it's going to be in those tubes to the left. Um, if you get a chance to take it, and try it it's you would think it's sugar and it wouldn't be that bad and it's just be sweet it it is sugar and it is sweet but it's like an overpowering i don't know it's not that great of a taste so when patients say it tastes nasty um it tastes nasty okay it is pure sugar but it tastes nasty um oxygen commonly used um it is a powerful medication though. So we'll talk about some administration routes. Um, well, we actually already have two with the non-rebreather, cannula, blow by are the um, main ways that we're gonna give that. Activated charcoal, um, occasionally, only occasionally used in poisoning cases. Um, the reason we took it away for the state of Utah is it wasn't, we were finding more injuries. So when you take it, it's supposed to bind with whatever poison is in your stomach so it can't get absorbed. Most people couldn't take it without puking and we were getting a lot of aspiration, aspiration uh, injuries and things that way too with it. Um, and what we were finding is, is it wasn't binding as well with the poisons as we thought it would. Same thing goes back to the evidence-based research just with the reports and reviewing the data. Um, we just, it's not used like it used to be. Um, when I first started in 08, we taught it and we had to try it at snow and it, it just, it tastes like charcoal. It's disgusting. Hold please. Hello. Oh, hey Alan, can I call you right back just a second? Sorry, I'm just in the middle of a class. Anybody? Sorry, guys, I thought it was one of you in the class calling for an issue we were having with it. Um, and then naloxone or Narcan. Um, it's an antidote for patient unconscious and in respiratory failure from taking narcotics or opioids. Um, the reason why I love that they are giving it to you guys now 
um, is it has no side effects if it's not a narcotic overdose. So if they're overdosed on something else, you can push a full dose of naloxone or Narcan on them and it's not going to do anything. If it is a narcotic, it is a very powerful um, drug to um, counteract a narcotic overdose. Um, some things to consider with it though, the patients are gonna do one of two things, if not both, if you give it to them too fast um, or too much of it, they're gonna come up swinging, fighting, or if you're really lucky, they're gonna come up puking. And if you're really, really lucky, they're gonna do both of those things for you. So it's one of those things when you give it and it truly is a narcotic, be ready for both of those things. If um, once you counteract that uh, narcotic overdose. Some ones that we're gonna talk about that you guys can help with and assist with is, um, and we're gonna go through the skills on this, a bronchial dilator inhaler. Uh, most of the time when we when we look at it, um, it's an emergency one and it's going to be a um, albuterol treatment with it. There's a few others, but 90% of the bronchodilators for an emergency use are um, albuterol. Uh, like this one's Simbacort, um, and it's more of a daily instead of a emergency one. Uh, so some other prescribed medication, we'll talk uh, the inhaler, we're gonna go over nitroglycerin and epinephrine as well. So the bronchodilators or the inhaler um, is usually with uh, patients with emphysema, asthma, or chronic bronchitis. So in the largest constricted, the breathing tube, so it, it is a bronchial, so the bronchi, it dilates them, makes them larger. Um, some common side effects with it, um, increased heart, uh, heart rate. It's the same thing as the receptors it reacts to with the lungs to um, make them larger. The heart has the same receptors that it binds with too. When it binds with those in the heart, it increases the rate. <coughs> and then it makes them just jittery. Everything's hyped up with them too. Um, that doesn't happen with all of them. Usually you'll see a slight increase in heart rate, um, but you can see a dramatically increased in heart rate and the jitters. But just because you don't see it when you give it to a patient doesn't mean it's not working either. We're going to monitor their breathing, not necessarily the side effects. So nitroglycerin is often prescribed for chest pain or angina is the term you'll use for it. Um, this is the liquid spray. Um, most of the time it's in a tablet though. That spray bottle right there is like $500. And you can get 30 tablets for next to nothing. So most of the time when you see it in the field, it's actually gonna be in a um, tablet. Um, so chest pain, cardiac origin, helps dilate the it's a vasodilator. So there are some, because it's a vasodilator, what does that do to blood pressure? It's gonna drop it. So if they already have a low blood pressure and we give them this, you're going to potentially drop their blood pressure to a, a dangerous level. So the blood pressure, we always say it needs to have a systolic of over 100 before we can give it. Um, if they're taking any medications for erectile dysfunction, um, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, or anything similar, does it specifically have to be a male that takes Viagra? No. Uh, originally, um, believe it or not, Viagra was actually a blood pressure medication that was um, designed to help lower blood pressure. And we just found out that the happy side effect from it was it helped with ED. So there are actually women that take Viagra or Cialis or something similar to help control blood pressure. So um, something I, you know, you don't want to ask it to a woman, are you taking um, 
Viagra or Cialis or anything like that. It's, are you taking anything for blood pressure? And then if they say yes, then ask them what it is and see if it's one of those, because there are, there are women that will take those drugs to control blood pressure. So epinephrine, most of the time you and you guys are going to do this with a patient assist. It's going to be in the auto ejectors. We'll cover those um, greatly in class. I promise you that. Um, the biggest thing we find with those is remembering which end the needle comes out because we've had a lot of, not EMTs, but a lot of the times bystanders that try and help. And that needle, instead of going into the patient's leg, gills right through their thumb because they jammed the wrong end and anyway it's an 18 gauge needle i promise you it'll go clear through your thumb and need and thumbnail and come right out the other side okay so we'll go over those two that way that can help you show how to use it but it's for um, severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis it's a vasoconstrictor um, relaxes the smooth muscles of the airway and allows them to open up same thing though, if it's responding and reacting in the lungs, we're gonna see a reaction in the heart. So the side effect in the heart, you'll see an increased rate and also an increase in blood pressure. That's usually rate dependent. So there are the auto eject um, or atropine auto injector to treat responders in the event of attack, meaning a um, hazardous material. So um, atropine, when we had mustard gas and some of that in World War II, um, what we found is, is that would counteract it if we could get enough of it in fast enough. What I'm going to tell you is if we respond to an event and we have that most of the time, we don't carry enough atropine on the ambulance to truly treat it. So it is one though that it is there, that's what it was designed for. Um, so it's an event of a terrorist attack or a gas attack. Um, so general information about medication. So some things that you guys will need to know um, is the drug names. So it's usually listed by its gener generic name but it also has three separate names. So the chemical name, um, it's the just the chemicals that go in to make it. It's usually a fairly long name. Um, you'll find like when you get your prescriptions, you'll find the chemical name in it. Um, and then the generic name. Um, so that's like Tylenol is actually a um, trade name where the general name is acetaminophen, okay? I'm not even going to try and pronounce the, <clears throat> the chemical name of it. Um, but a lot of the times too, when you go to get a prescription, the last, do you want the trade or the generic? So um, some of the newer medications, another reason why people have a hard time taking them is, is if the trade name or the company develops it, it's seven years before another company can come up with a generic for it. So they use that as a way to re-get, re, um, coop their cost in developing it. Um, trade name is a brand, brand name like Tylenol. Um, is the big one that always comes out. Bear. Um, anyway, there's another one that's a trade name. Uh, one or more trade names given by the drug manufacturers. Some huge things. You guys need to know all of these when we get ready to give a medication. And we'll hit these hard in the class. Um, we have some TTGs that once we start the hand on, hands on stuff, I'll hand out that have um, side effects, contraindications, all of that on it. So, indications are is why are we giving it? Um, so, for um, glucose, the indication for it is low blood sugar. Nitroglycerin is as we're having a cardiac event. Oxygen is as we're having um, a hypoxic event or low oxygen saturation. Um, the contraindications are why would we not give this? So nitro is a big one we always talk about with it. 
Um, if they already have a low blood pressure, we know it's going to lower it again. We're not going to give it to them so we don't drop it to an unsafe level. Side effects are something that happens, like we talked about the side effects in the heart. If we're giving a medication for the lungs, it's going to have a side effect in the heart. So it's an unintended effect of the drug, but it's a known effect of it too. Does that make sense? We're not giving it for that treatment, but it's going to happen because we're giving this medication. Um, an untoward effect, so that's a negative side effect um, that is not expected, meaning if we give a medication, we're not expecting to have an allergic reaction to epinephrine, which you never could, but it's a reaction that's not expected, okay? But the big ones that you guys need to know are the top three, the indications, contraindications, and side effects. Um, so forms of medications come in a lot of different forms that we can give. Um, so. Um, compressed powders or tablets, so that's your your medication most of the time. So Tylenol, ibuprofen is usually in a compressed pout is a powder that's compressed to a tablet. Um, liquids you can get it for kids too. A lot of times there are medications in a liquid because just to get them so they don't have to swallow it. Gels um, like your nighttime, it's usually in a capsule with a liquid inside of it um, that once you take it gets in your body. The capsule. Um, breaks down and then the gel is um, dispersed into your bloodstream. Suspension, so activated charcoal actually was a suspension. So you'd mix it with a liquid to suspend it in it and then you would drink it. Um, yeah. So your fine powders too, it's the same thing. Like uh, This is horrible. The, the best fine powder example I can give you is heroin or cocaine where they'll break it up into a fine powder and, and inhale it, okay? Um, gases, oxygen is a big one. And then nitroglycerin um, is actually usually a sublingual, meaning it goes under the tongue and it just dissolves into the bloodstream that way. Um, sublingual medications, though you're gonna wanna have a glove on, like if you are giving somebody nitro and you don't have a glove on, you're gonna get a massive freaking headache because it's gonna absorb in through your skin. If it's sublingual, it means it's easily absorbed into skin or tissue. So if you have it on your hand, it's gonna absorb into your hand, you're gonna get the effect of it as well as a patient. So sublinguals, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have a glove on. Um, patches is the other one too, a slow that's not here. Um, a lot of your pain medications and stuff like that are going to be on a patch too if we're doing pain management. Um, so they'll be on a patch that'll just um, dissolve into the skin that way too. Administrating or assisting it with medications is a serious responsibility. The thing I'm going to tell you guys is, is if you know your med medications and its indications and contraindications, um, it's not most of the drugs that you guys are going to give the toxic. So when we start dealing with an this as an in it, but we start looking at the therapeutic effect. Most of the drugs that we give in EMS have a very large therapeutic effect, meaning that you have to give them quite a bit of it to overdose. Um, so let's say baby aspirin is 324 milligrams is what we're going to give them or 325. Mm -hmm. Let's say they say, oh, well, I took four of them um, after you gave them four. So they've had, now they've had instead of 325, we're dealing with 650. You're still within the ther therapeutic range of that drug. So we don't have drugs in EMS that have a large therapeutic or a small therapeutic range. Um, just, just because it's usually it's weight-based, It's if the side effects happen, you're going to need other medications and other resources. So most of our drugs that we give have a very large therapeutic range. 
but use your, um, and instead of the word I'm going to throw out there, instead of judgment is use your training and use your education. Um, know your medications and spend some time to understand the medications that you guys can give. So as we start dealing with, um, medic or with medical authorization, we're going to talk about two different, um, terms, offline medical, um, Medical direction is usually your standing orders or your protocols, meaning you don't speak to a physician. He's written it out and signed, hey, if you see a person with chest pain and they meet, they don't have any of the contraindications for baby aspirin, you're going to give them 324 milligrams without calling in. Okay. When you start running with a service, 99% of our Medical direction is through protocols and standing orders or offline medical direction. Online medical direction, a lot of the times for you guys is basic and for the national, most of your drugs are going to be a online medication, meaning you have to call and get permission from the physician to give it. Okay, your medical director is the term we'll use in the, um, when we start doing the hands-on part of it. So that's online, meaning you have to speak directly to the physician. We're going to listen to the order, repeat it back word for word, and then ask for clarity if needed. And that goes down to the, hey, this doesn't sound right, or I don't think that's a proper treatment. Same with asking um, another ALS crew or physician or another ALS or EMT, you, we can ask a physician the same thing. Know these five rights. You will see them on a test in the national. You will see them on a test here. And I'm going to add a sixth right to it for my class. But we're going to go over the first five, and then I'll add the last one to it. Um, do I have the right patient? Meaning is this, and a lot of that goes to the indications. Is he, in, is he giving me the indications or the signs that he needs this medication? Is it the right time to administer the medication? Meaning if he is still conscious and able to protect his own airway, then we'll give him baby aspirin. If he all of a sudden becomes unconscious, can't protect his airway, we're not gonna shove baby aspirin down his throat, okay? Is it the right medication? Are we giving an inhaler for a cardiac arrest or are we giving nitroglycerin or um, baby aspirin, okay? Right dose, and a lot of that goes back to your protocols and standing orders. Like aspirin is 325 milligrams or, and I don't know who did the math on this, but or for 81 milligram baby aspirin because they come in 81 milligrams. For me, four times eight is 324, but we always say they get 325. But I did go to school at North Sam Pete, so we'll have to take that into account too, I guess. Um, and then am I giving the right medication by the right route? Meaning I'm not going to tell him to take a nitroglycerin that's sublingual, so it's supposed to go under the tongue and swallow it, okay? And then this goes back to chapter 16. Did I get do the right documentation? It goes back to the same thing. If you did it, write it. And in your documentation, include the five rights when you document it. So what would be the potential risk to a patient if each of the five rights were not checked prior to administration? <laughs> Excuse me. And that one goes back to that we're going to do harm to the patient. <laughs> oh my gosh, I got the sneeze. Okay. And it really does come down to patient advocacy and patient protection. If we did all those five rights, chances are we did the right medication, we've done the right treatment, and all of our I's and T's are crossed. Not only for us, but for the patient as well. Excuse me. The other part we'll talk about is routes of administration. 
So oral is 99% of what we take home for our prescriptions, right? It's usually swallowed or chewed um, and goes into the stomach and is dissolved that way. <coughs> Sublingual, that one goes under the tongue and is usually dissolved that way. Um, and then inhaled, so the sublingual one is the nitroglycerin usually is the one we refer to it. Inhaled is uh, your inhalers, right? They're usually um, aerosolized particles such as an inhaler and gas or oxygen. Intranasal, the one we'll usually talk about with that for you guys, um, is sprayed into the nostrils, so Narcan is usually given um, intranasally. So one squirt up each nair with the intravenous. Um, that's usually when we get the advanced crew on. Um, we'll start an IV into the inner, into the vein, and then it's the medications administered directly into the vein itself. Um, intermuscular. So a lot of the times when we deal with animals um, and like penicillin shots, um, fat, IV or vaccinations, things like that are going to be an intermuscular. So it's got to go directly into the muscle. It's usually at a 90 degree angle straight into the muscle. Um, sub Q. So we're going to try and hit the layer between the muscle and underneath the skin. So it's usually at about a 30 to 45 degree angle. And we're going to go underneath and administer the medication there. My favorite one is interosseous. So we literally drill a needle into the bone. We either do it into the tibia or we can do it into the humerus. And we'll give medications through it. Okay. I love it because you can't miss. And unless somebody really pulls on it, um, you can't lose it either. Okay. Uh, most of the time that one we'll see like our drug overdoses, um, cardiac arrest, things like that, that we need an IV, we need it now and we can't miss. Okay. Um, endotracheal, so it's sprayed directly into the tube inserted into the trachea. So when the paramedic or um, anesthesiologist innovates them, then we can give that medication right down that tube that goes in and is dissolved into the lungs. For you guys, most of what you're gonna do is gonna be those first four. It's gonna be oral, sublingual, inhaled, or intranasal. <clears throat> so some things to consider, and it's just a, dip, a fancy way of saying, so when we talk about pharma, pharma, dy, pharma, pharma dynamic considerations, it's the study of, of how it affects the body. A lot of the times, you know, we talk, the big one I always use is the heart and lungs. We're trying to give it for one part of it, but it still affects other parts of the bodies. Um, so they study a lot of your long-term effects, whether it goes into your liver, genes, whatever that may be. Um, and then two, how will it affect my patient specifically? Um, a lot of the times we're talking ethnicity when we're talking about that. And then age too, because a lot of the times medications, as we get older, our metabolism slows down. We're harder to get off weight, all of that stuff. Well, not only does all of that slow down, but also our body's ability to um, break down medications is slower. So they'll have to take more or either more milligrams or more often through the day to allow that to happen. And it's the same thing with the specific factors on how it works. Different patients, male versus female, their bodies break medications down differently too. And the fun part, right? Reassessment. After we give a medication, within three to five minutes, we need another set of vitals and a documented reassessment of the patient. If it has longer side effects or so some medications, none of what you guys will give will usually do this, but um, if it has longer side effects, then you're going to have to readdress or reassess every five minutes until you're outside of the window of that side effect happening. So usually within three to five minutes, we want another set of vitals and reassess the patient after we give a medication. 
Um, so some other medications too. So Advar um, is usually prescribed for respiratory disease. It's a steroid. Um, it should not be used for emergency treatment of an acute breathing problem. The emergency one is the albuterol that we go back to. Um, Q-Var is another one. Um, they're usually just a steroid that you're taking. Okay. The other one too, is there's some different blood pressure medications. Um, an emergency situation, we're not going to have them take more than what they're prescribed. Okay. It's just not, not what it was meant. It's for maintenance, not for emergency. Um, also, there's some herbal agents too than what they're used for sometimes. So your ginkgo, um, circulation in the legs, dementia, and then ringing in the ears. What you'll usually find with these guys too is what we get called there for is another reason, but we'll find that they're taking these. And what happens a lot of the times too, if a little is good, a lot's better is what people think. And they'll actually can overdose from some of these too, okay? Um, ginger is a really good one for nausea and vomiting that people take though too. And then like fish oil, um, flaxseed, uh, there's a number of others. This is really a small um, list though. So there are a lot of other ones, I guess, that way. Um, so some things that you guys will get asked to help with for the advanced part of it. Um, a lot of the time you guys are going to get asked to help set up an IV um, and help prep it. Um, so way fluid and medications be managed directly into the vein. Most of them now are actually a, we, we used to call it a heparin lock, but we're found as we can saline lock it just as easy. Heparin had a lot of other side effects that just weren't great. Um, and saline, we can keep it open for a long period of times too, if we flush it frequently. Um, so a catheter is placed into the vein. A cap is placed over the end of it. And it has a one-way valve on it. It also, not only to prevent blood from coming back, but any foreign bodies from going in. Um, the lock contains, it's a port for medic medication. A lot of the times... In the past, we started the line, everybody got a little bit of fluid or a bag of fluid. What we found, same thing going back to our Polaris and our tracking and our documentation is, is we were overhydrating a lot of people. So we went from everybody having a bag to most people just get a saline lock. We just want access for medication. Or if for some reason they do start going down the hill, then we can give them, um, start giving them fluid too if their blood pressure tanks out on us or blood or fluid or whatever it needs. So a lot of the times with that, um, for me and what most um, advanced will ask is if you just have the, the lock is usually a small tube, three to five inches, um, we'll hand you it with a 10 cc syringe of saline and just have you hold it once we get the flash, pull the needle out and the catheter is just left there. We'll attach that and flush it and then have you guys help us secure it. And I think we go over securing it, taping, get it, make sure it gets taped down and all of that. Um, so it's secure. We just don't want to lose it. If we went through the effort of getting it, I want to protect it. Okay. Um, so ways it can be administered. So your traditional IV bag is another one that they're usually, a, um, most of the time, they used to be a thousand cc's. Most of them are now um, like a 500 or a 250. We never had the patient long enough in most agencies to get a full thousand cc's in them. So we went to the smaller bags. Also, it's a lot harder to overhydrate somebody if you only have 500 cc's available versus a thousand was the other reason we went to it. But it's got to be hung above the patient. It's a gravity flow. There are IV pumps. Most of the time in the field, you won't see those. You'll see those on transfers. Um, constantly flows fluid and medication into the patient. So the IV fluid, it's a that's a traditional. We'll, if we don't, I'll come back to some other ones too. So setting it up for the, an IV, it's got three important parts. 
of the, it's a clear plastic tubing connected to the fluid bag and then to the catheter. So we have the drip chamber. Oh. Drip chamber, and we'll go over this, the flow regulator, um, the drug or needle port and the extensions. Um, so it's easy to disroll the patient without pulling the IV. So that's that ex little four to six inch tube. It's got the valve on it. We'll usually put one of those on the end so we can hurry and pop it off, slip patient's clothing off without having to pull the IV or cap it. So there's your bag. We're gonna check and make sure um, it's not, or that it's clear and that it's not expired. Um, once IV fluid expires, it'll start to crystallize and you'll see white floaties and stuff in it. If we're seeing that, we're, we don't wanna put that into the patient. So it'll have an expiration date and it should be clear. And the other one in, they don't consider in rural areas is it can't be frozen either. So a lot of times we'll have it on the heater bag or whatever to try and warm the patient with it too. <clears throat> so the drip set is what's in his right hand. It will have a large needle, plastic needle on it. <clears throat> it will be covered and you'll have to pull that off. Um, we want to try and keep this as clean and sterile as we can too. So you'll notice his gloves are nice and clean. Um, he's not, once he pulls that off, he's not going to physically touch the white end on that needle or on that drip chamber. There'll be two ports on your IV bags. Um, the one that you want will have a little tab over it that you'll pull off and it'll leave an open port there for you. It won't leak until you've spiked it. But once you've taken that hard plastic needle that's on the end of that drip chamber and puncture that, if you pull that out, it'll just start flowing. It'll have a free flow out of that bag. And once you puncture it, if you end up pulling that off, um, you're supposed to get another bag to put on it. You should never re-spike it the same bag. We're going to flush it. That's what that picture is supposed to be showing you. Um, you're going to open the flow regulator and you're going to let it flow until all the air is out of the line. So until you have a fairly good stream of um, IV fluid, coming out of the end of the tube. Um, it takes a lot of air to cause an air embolism, but if you don't flush the tube and you shove that all in, all that air into them, you definitely have created an air embolism. So we got to make sure and flush that line. Once you've done that, the flow regulator, it's just a little plastic wheel. We're going to push it up, clamp it off until we're ready to, um, the advance or paramedics ready to set the flow rate to it. So I was trouble shooting some problems though with it um, that you guys will have. Far too often what happens is, is we'll, if you flush it with a 10 cc syringe, it's easy to create enough pressure that the rubber band that we put on to make the veins pop, it will push past them while your IV bag won't. So most of the time, if it's initial, the rubber band's still on the patient. So let's check for that first. Um, the other one too is the flow regulator. So it talks about the flow regulator, but most sets actually have two clamps on it too. So some EMTs and, and advanced will use the flow regulator. Some of them will use the clamp. So you got to start at the bag and follow that tubing down and make sure that there's no clamps or flow regulators on it. Um, tubing is kinked. It's a fairly small, easy, pliable, and it's easily kinked that way. And then pay, it's caught underneath the patient or equipment. So a lot of the times when we move them from place to place, you'll have an issue because it gets pinched either like in the arm rails or pinched under the patient or kinked. Um, so every time you move a patient, you've got to reassess that IV and make sure it's flowing. So if you move them from your gurney to the hospital bed, we're going to reassess it. it want, if you're taking a transfer, and you're moving from the hospital bed to ours, it gets reassessed too. Okay. Um, adjust the flow rate properly. And then the big one that we ask your guys' help too is monitor the IV site for infiltration or the other, it's a blown IV. So if it's starting to infiltrate, you'll start to see a large bubble and fluid 
um, bubble underneath the skin and, and or fluid running down the patient's arm. If you're seeing that, the IV is infiltrated and you're gonna have to shut it off and start it. Okay. As far as adjust the flow rate properly, that, that will be up to the paramedic and um, to give you that flow rate. So when they're saying flow rate, that drip chamber, you'll see a drop and they're set to 15 drops, 10 or 60, meaning it takes 15 drops to get one ml of fluid or it takes 60 or it takes 15. So if we say we want um, a drip rate of five per minute, so you'll just count that drop for or how many drops come down in one minute, okay? And the advance can go over that with you too. And that is it for tonight, guys. Any questions for me? For you guys out in Zoom land, if you have any questions, drop it in the chat. If not, all of you guys had your names on it. Thank you. Thank you for including that so I can get you on the roll. And we will see you guys next Thursday night.